It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to address a subject that most of the world needs to know, but unfortunately doesn't know. Um, the dangers posed by using animal products in the human diet, whether it be animal flesh or the um, um, other body fluids of animals. So we'll continue by going into slide one here, looking at meat, dairy, and human disease. We basically, every day of our life, like everything else, we have choices to make. And as human beings, we're not air creatures or water creatures per se. We do need air and water, of course. But uh, we also are food creatures. We need food. And um, the choices we have, and I'm contrasting um, plant foods versus the carcasses of dead animals. And um, one is visually stimulating and the other is um, a little harder to describe. Okay. Here we're looking at two alternate food harvests. Um, one not so pleasant to look at and the other one very, very unpleasant to look at. So those are the kinds of choices we face every day. <clears throat> I'll quote a prominent microbiologist who states there's now an overwhelming scientific as well as a medical case for avoiding the consumption of meat and meat products despite the government's attempts to persuade us otherwise. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this evening's lecture. What is the, um, the other case that is rarely addressed? This here is very compelling, this data. What we have on the screen are six different cities in different regions of the Western Hemisphere. San Francisco, California, or yeah, I guess the Eastern Hemisphere too, Bristol, England, Santiago, Chile, Ribeiro, Brazil, Mexico City, Guatemala City. These are heart disease death rates per 100,000. And you can see Guatemala City, which down here consumes the least um, flesh food of any of these capitals, has by far the lowest heart disease death rate. Next comes Mexico City, then Ribeiro, then Santiago, then Bristol, England, and then San Francisco. So we see a very, very clear trend line, um, a very, very clear correlation between the consumption of meat or flesh foods and heart disease deaths. And no one can argue with that kind of uh, information. It's very compelling. The action of red meat on the human colon. The concentration of carcinogens called nitrosamines are increased in the colon when we ingest red meat. Um, the nitrosamines are particularly found in processed meats and bacon, and they're created within the human body when eating meats, these meats in particular. There's also an excess of carcinogenic tryptophan, which is an amino acid that is present. Uh, Iron-rich meat products appear to increase the risk of cancer by promoting oxidation, and carcinogens also result from the cooking of various meats. So, it should come as no surprise that when we look at bowel cancer deaths, we see a very, very similar picture to heart disease. Same cities, same trend lines, per capita meat consumption, identical correlations is with heart disease for bowel cancer deaths. Very clear and compelling data. So the warning is, if you're interested in dying of heart disease or bowel cancer, then eat lots of meat. Um, and if you don't want these diseases, then eat a lot of plant foods. Very simple conclusion, very logical. Um, here we have age-adjusted mortality per 100,000. Um, those on a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet have the lowest rate for ovarian cancer risk. And we're talking here meat, poultry, as well as fish in the diet. Um, those who eat those three types of meat one to three times a week, a much higher mortality rate. Those who are eating flesh foods four or more times per week, it's uh, 
significantly higher even. And I should mention that vegans would be way, way down here somewhere, very low. But this table didn't include vegans, but it would be significantly lower than a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet. And here are the spacious quarters of chickens on a factory farm. Lots of breathing space and ability to move your wings. I say that facetiously. Um, it's very sad that they eat their own fecal matter. They get very nervous and jittery. They don't live very long. And they're under very, very miserable conditions, obviously. Here we see another a factory farm picture. And as we look at today's broiler meat chickens, they are actually genetically altered to grow twice as fast and twice as large as their ancestors. So when you're eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, you're very likely getting genetically modified um, chicken flesh. And they're pushed beyond their biological limits. They grow so rapidly, their heart and their lungs can't support the rest of their body. This results in congestive heart failure and in death. These chickens also experience crippling leg disorders. Their legs can't su support <clears throat> their abnormally heavy bodies. They're also confined in unsanitary factory farms. They frequently succumb to heat prostration, various infectious diseases, as well as cancer. Now, what's also interesting about chickens that most people may not be aware is that um, chicken producers are allowed when the chickens are slaughtered and they're put on conveyor belts, they all end up in this huge, huge vat with their entrails and their body fluids and everything else. And they're allowed to leave the meat in there for a period of time long enough to allow a certain percentage increase in body weight in the meat. So they're absorbing their waste matter and everything else into the tissue system before the chicken meat is actually put on the market, whether it be supermarkets or fast food joints. So I just thought you'd like to know that little sidelight. Um, some infectious disease agents in meat include Salmonella, Listeria, Helicobacter, as well as uh, Yersinia. <clears throat> There's also toxigenic E. coli, which can be found in beef, as well as raw and pasteurized milk sausages, and even in venison. E. coli contamination ground beef recalls in 2011. There's an interesting website where I got this information. Uh, it's ent entitled foodpoisonjournal.com. And they monitor uh, what's happening with the food industry across the United States and what kinds of foods have been infected or are toxic. And they talk about here, basically, all these different uh, major meat packers. Tri-state beef had to recall over a quarter million pounds, 228,000 pounds of beef because of E. coli infection. And overall, there was over 300,000 pounds recalled this year, the year 2011. Listeria bacteria, the symptoms are very similar to getting influenza. Over 1,000 Americans are infected each year. Of these, 250 people die, unlike the flu. A very, very small percentage of people who get the flu actually die, whereas about almost one in four die of this condition. The highest risk of foods are soft cheeses and undercooked chicken. As well, the uh, US Department of Agriculture tested 19 different brands of hot dogs, of which 20% tested positive for listeria. Uh, Paget's disease, probably caused by a prion, you know what prions are, uh, leads to bones being weakened, thickened, and deformed. Um, it can affect the pelvis, collarbone, skull, spine, and long bones of the leg. Chronic pain may occur. Risk factors for this disease include uh, eating brain and organ meats, eating meat traceable to sick livestock, and also even handling cattle while farming or engaged in breeding. Um, infectious illnesses in animal products. It's estimated that about 80 million intestinal illnesses occur in the U.S. alone each year 
from eating infected animal products. That's many tens of millions of people. Many thousands of lives are claimed every year as well from eating these same kind of infected animal products. Some diseases in animals that can threaten human health include uh, BSC, which is the um, longer term for mad cow disease, the prions found in it. Um, e. coli bacteria, listeria, salmonella, a bovine leukemia virus. And by the way, um, here in Canada, I think it's around 60 to 70 percent of cattle are infected with bovine leukemia virus. In the U.S., the figures are pretty similar. There's also BIV virus, which is cow AIDS. Cancer, uh, Clostridium uh, perfringens, and Hel Helicobacter, Yersinia, and Crohn's disease, you know, which is an uh, inflammatory disease of the bowels, similar to ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> Human diseases that can be directly derived from animals as well as animal products. Quite a long list. Melanoma, lymphoma, stomach cancer, prostate cancer, Hodgkin's disease, uh, leukemia, plague, multiple myeloma, roundworm, tapeworm, giardia, which is a blood parasite, trichinosis, which is primarily from eating ham or um, pig products, hookworm, rabies, vibrio cholera, anthrax, and brucellosis. So quite a long list of diseases, as you can see. Dangerous viruses found in dairy cattle, as I mentioned, include the leukemia virus and the bovine immunodeficiency virus, BIV. It is structurally, the immunodeficiency virus is structurally and genetically uh, closely related to human immunodeficiency virus, what we refer to as HIV, the type one associated with AIDS in humans. Bovine leukemia virus, and I mentioned a 70% infection rate in Canadian cattle, is in the same group as the human T-cell le uh, leukemia, lymphotropic virus type 1, HTLV1. Both viruses can cross species lines and thus infect other animals like sheep, goats, chimpanzees, primates, and they develop the disease. The helicobacter bacteria, over half of cases, can be traced to chicken consumption. Um, usually in the bird's intestines. Uh, most chickens today are killed by automated machines. Other sources are beef, cake icing, I presume because of eggs, and eggs and raw milk. And then there's salmonella, which we all are maybe more familiar with, found in raw and past, both raw and pasteurized milk, eggs, ice cream, sausages, salami, beef jerky, and chicken. Now, what about prions? Let's get back to prions. Um, obviously, the highest source of prions would be the um, nervous system in meat and the brain. Organ tissue also can carry significant risk. It can also be found to a limit, more limited extent in muscle meat. It's also been documented in milk. In many health supplements feature uh, animal glandular extracts, which can contain prions. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when buying supplements. There are two types of um, CJD, kreutzfeldt jakob disease. Um, and the class, what they refer to as classic CJD, is not related to a bovine spongiform encephal encephalopathy, which is uh, BCJ, but rather uh, VCG day variant CJD is derived from BSC or mad cow. Um, the classic CJD, there are three types. Uh, one type is uh, referred to as sporadic, which is the most common. The other type is um, familial, meaning it's inherited. And the third type is iatrogenic, meaning it's doctor caused during an operation or medical procedure. Um, but the, you know, the uh, VCJD is animal derived. And the median age of death, interestingly, for variant CJD, which is the human form of mad cow, is 28 years of age, the median age of death, whereas the classic CJD, it's 68 years of age, which is sort of interesting. And the brain symptoms are very similar between the two types of CJD. Um, variant CGD reached North America, um, was found in mink, which may well have eaten, been fed animal protein from downer cows. 
There was also an outbreak in Kentucky traced to squirrel consumption. It's a real puzzle how the squirrel contracted it. There was a human outbreak in Oklahoma, possibly from deer meat. May well have been from cow meat as well. Um, misdiagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. A study at Yale University, 13% of presumed Alzheimer's disease patients were also found to have the human variant of mad cow, VCJD. Another study done at the University of Pittsburgh on 54 dementia patients found that about 5.5% actually had VCJD, human variant, mad cow. Yet the CDC reports that only one human case of variant CJD has occurred between 1995 and 2004. Is this statistic for real? Big question mark. My younger, or not my younger, my, my daughter uh, worked at Loma Linda Medical Center in the emergency room. And one of the doctors, she's not a doctor, confided to her that when they get these Alzheimer's cases in, a number of them actually have um, creutzfeldt jakob disease. But they are not allowed to put it into the records for political reasons. Um, so only heaven knows how many people are actually contracting um, this disease. In fact, uh, Lawrence Broxmeyer, a medical doctor, has done some interesting research on this. And uh, he believes, um, he, said, as he, he says, the Topsy studies reveal that in the range of 5 to 30 percent of the 4,500,000 Alzheimer's victims in the U.S., and an untold number of those with dementia could actually have the variant form, meaning the mad cow disease derived form, of CJD, um, called mad cow in humans. Alzheimer, Kritzfeld, Jacob, and mad cow disease could be caused by eating the meat or dairy in consumer products or feed. The full number of US CJD patients will never be known until it is proclaimed a reportable disease. Um, interestingly, the subtitle of the article published by Elsevier in Medical Hypothesis, where I got this information, the subtitle is um, Losing Your Mind for the Sake of a Shake or a Burger. Okay. Uh, prions and infectious power cannot be destroyed by anti-infective sterilization procedures, by high-dosage radiation, by freezing, by drying, or by high temperatures as high as 360 degrees centigrade or 680 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's almost like they're invincible. Um, this is a pretty scary slide. Um, it's becoming public policy in different parts of the US of governments to begin to use human waste sludge from sewer systems as fertilizer. And a study by research at the University of Wisconsin found that BSE prions, mad cow disease prions, which enter wastewater treatment plants through slaughterhouse drains, can survive wastewater decontamination procedures. Three weeks of filtration, separation, incubation with microbes that break down contaminants in the sludge. So the prions end up alive and well in sludge-based fertilizers potentially contaminating fruits and vegetables. So it's sort of scary to think you can get mad cow disease from eating a fruit or a vegetable. So um, avoid any food grown on sludge, <laughs> wastewater sludge. Um, another reason to grow your own food. Um, BSE is transmissible to, from, and between cattle, goats, sheep, pigs, elk, domestic cats, mule deer, monkeys, and mice. So quite a range of animals. Um, and this is very interesting. Uh, officially on the CDC website, they say that, um, that um, classical CJD, not the mad cow CJD, um, cannot be determined as the source, meaning it just happens. We don't know why it's happening or what the source is. But this was a study done, um, a research study, in which they looked at the fact that classical CJD is actually coming from eating pig flesh, or ham, pork, pork products. 
various epidemiological studies, and this was a review study, meaning they brought multiple studies together, point to a link between pork consumption and sporadic CJD. And sporadic CJD is about 85 to 90 percent of classic CJD cases. So creutzfeldt jakob disease is now associated with eating roast pork, ham, hot dogs, pork chops, smoked pork, and scrap, scrapple, pork pudding. Researchers have found that the, quote, consumption of pork, as well as the processed products, such as ham and scrapple, may be considered as risk factors in the development of creutzfeldt jakob disease. Compared to people that did not eat ham, those who included ham in their diet appeared 10 times more likely to develop creutzfeldt jakob disease. So we're talking a thousand times, or a thousand percent rather, greater likelihood of getting this disease. So all you ham eaters who may watch this, you know what to do. Okay, let's see. By the way, the disease incubates a long time, so you quit eating ham today, you may still get the disease nine or 10 years from now, um, which isn't too pleasant to think about. So what about meat, dairy, and hip fractures? Worldwide, the highest hip fracture rates occur among populations which consume the most animal foods and dairy. The highest fracture rates are occurring in the United States, Canada, Norway, Sweden, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, the lowest hip fracture rates occur among peoples from rural regions of Asia and Africa who usually consume little or no dairy foods. And also, in many of those countries and rural regions, they're too poor to afford meat. I remember talking to a friend of mine who um, was in Southeast Asia, and um, he um, himself was a vegan, and he saw one of the local native people out in the rural regions pick up a huge bag of rice, which weighed about 150 pounds or you know, 75 kilo, and he just grabbed it almost with one hand, threw it on his back, and start running with it. And he couldn't believe, you know, how can this guy be so strong? So he walked up to him and tapped him and says, um, what kind of diet do you eat? Oh, we just eat the vegetables and the garden produce because we can't afford meat. <laughs> but he had incredible stamina. And um, I think one of the slides will be talking about stamina and uh, flesh foods. If it's not tonight, it'll be tomorrow night. Um, this is sort of interesting. This is, now we're going to look at milk. We've been looking a lot at meat. We're going to switch over to dairy pr uh, products and milk primarily. Um, these are the different protein levels in various milk of different species. It's sort of interesting because you see this very, very strong correlation between protein content and the time required by a nursing infant to double their birth weight or, or their, their weight um, in days. So for a human baby eating or rather drinking mother's milk, the mean protein content milligrams per liter of human milk is only 1.2 uh, milligrams, very, very low protein in human milk. And it takes an infant baby about 120 days to double their weight. Uh, a horse is exactly double protein what a human is and exactly half of the 120 days to double a, um, a colt's weight or a, a baby horse. Cow, higher again, 3.347 days. Goat, 4.119 days. Dog, 7.1 milligram, eight days to a double weight. Cat, nine, even higher, shorter time. And finally, a rat, almost 12 milligrams and doubles weight in only four and a half days. So the creator designed um, these different milks to produce different effects depending on the physiology of the animal that's breastfeeding. So obviously, no species should be drinking the milk of another species, very obvious. Um, got some interesting pictures about that shortly. Milk production, incredible increase. In fact, when I saw this table, it was from a very reputable source, by the way, um, it was hard to believe. And so I actually did some math, you know, did some numbers and got out the calculator. And it turns out that this phenomenal increase in milk output, you know, from uh, annual production, this is 1948 here, 1998 here. And it's due largely to force feeding, including the use of drugs, antibiotics, and hormones, combined with scheduled milking 24 hours a day, these poor cows. 
And, um, and so basically the cows, to at least 98, maybe it's worse now, because this was like, what, 13 years ago? Um, at um, this level of milk turned out, I did the calculations, is about 12, 12 and a half gallons per day per cow. So cows way back in 48 were producing basically about one gallon a day you know, by comparison. So it's a massive increase, incredible. Um, in a normal, healthy environment, dairy cows live in excess of 25 years. That's your old, you know, grass grazing cow on the farm. Healthy, sunshine, fresh air, no stress, um, only milks its offspring, um, and some limited milk maybe for the, you know, the family on the farm. But um, modern factory farm dairies, they basically have turned their cows into milk machines running 24 hours a day. Most are now slaughtered, because they have to be, um, after in a range of three to five years. So they live very, very short lives and then are turned into meat. It's very sad. In fact, my, my brother visited one of the factory um, dairies in the northeastern U.S. and uh, they showed him around and you know, the 24-hour milking machines, and he looked in the, you know, where the milk was coming in, and there was all this red floating around in it. And he said, what's that? Well, that's blood. You know, blood routinely comes in with, with the milk. And um, sort of sad. The udders of factory bred and farm dairy cows, when they're, when they're not milked around the clock, can get so large their hind legs become permanently spread and can cause lameness. The oversized udder condition also is commonly found in mastitis in cattle. Very, very sad. You can see this massive um, milk sac or udder. And then too, with genetic man manipulation, hormones, intensive production technologies, um, with, with modern cows being milked around the clock, they produce that 12 whatever gallons is about 100 pounds of milk a day, 10 times more than they would produce naturally. Sort of unbelievable, isn't it? Slogans of the North American dairy industry. Well, the first one is milk. What a surprise. Real men drink milk. Everybody needs milk. Milk is a natural. Milk is a perfect food. Milk drink it for all it's worth. Milk drinkers make better lovers. And there's the milk. Milk has something for everybody. So it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? <laughs> Nothing like um, advertising. In no mammalian species, of course, except for the human family, is the practice of milk consumption continued after the weaning period. And you got these cows with their sign, drink human milk, <laughs> if they were the advertisers engaged in this foolish practice. Um, here we see the statement, it is not natural for humans to drink cow's milk. You have no more need of cow's milk than you do rat's milk or horse's milk or elephant's milk. Cow's milk is a high-fat fluid ex exquisitely designed to turn a 65-pound calf into a 400-pound cow, and that's what cow milk is for. Um, sort of an interesting picture there. <laughs> a man drinking milk. Let's see. <laughs> anyway. Cow's milk facts. Um, cow's milk is actually an unhealthy fluid for mostly today disease-ridden animals, carrying a wide range of dangerous and disease-causing uh, substances. All, all cow's milk, whether regular or organic, has 59 active hormones, scores of allergens, fat, and cholesterol. And also in cow's milk, there will be measurable quantities of uh, herbicides, chemicals that kill plants, pesticides, dioxins, up to 200 times safe levels, and up to 52 powerful antibiotics. And there's also blood, pus, feces, bacteria, and viruses. 49% uh, of the calories in milk are from fat. 2% milk, 35% of the calories in 2% milk are from fat. Cheddar cheese, 74% of the calories are from fat. Butter, 100% of the calories are from fat. What about 
milk and somatic or pus cells. As many as 750 million pus cells per liter have been measured in some milk products. Uh, to alleviate this, the cows are pumped full of antibiotics. It's primarily caused, I believe, by mastitis, the pus. Supermarket shelves in most regions of North America carry milk, <coughs> excuse me, containing in excess of 300 million pus cells per liter. The European Union and Canada legally allow for 400 million pus cells per liter. Each bite of hard cheese has 10 times whatever was in that sip of milk because it takes 10 pounds of milk to make one pound of cheese. Each bite of ice cream, if it's real ice cream and not the um, chemical artificial type, um, has uh, 12 times the um, quantity of what is in milk and every swipe of butter 21 times whatever was in that, in the fat molecules in a sip of milk. The average person currently consumes roughly 586 pounds of dairy products per year. And they just love that pizza. What about milk and calcium? Um, calcium that humans consume from plants, and by the way, plants are the best source of calcium, especially greens grown on good, <coughs> grown on good soil. Um, they come with a large amount of magnesium, which is essential for calcium absorption or assimilation. Um, calcium in cow's milk is largely useless because it has insufficient magnesium. And as well, the calcium molecule in cow's milk is much, much larger than the calcium molecule in human milk. About 11% of cow's milk calcium is actually absorbed as nutrient. So a very small fraction. Uh, nations with the highest amount of milk and dairy consumption also have the highest rates of osteoporosis. And here we see the uh, linkage to both female and male cancers of milk. Researchers link uh, the lactose and fat in cow's milk with ovarian cancer. The um, calcium found in cow's milk lowers concentrations of a critical type of vitamin D that protects against prostate cancer and thus raises men's overall risk of prostate cancer. About 7,500 middle-aged males were followed for 30 years. They all had a daily intake of 16 or more ounces of milk, and then they compared them with non-milk drinkers. <clears throat> the milk drinkers had a 230% greater risk of developing the neurodegenerative disorder Parkinson's disease. This is found in uh, the journal Neurology. A study published in the Journal of Neuroepidemiology uh, revealed an association between eating dairy foods and an increase in multiple sclerosis. So that's something nobody wants is MS. So avoid dairy products. A few more milk facts. The cholesterol content of those three glasses of milk is equivalent to what one would get from eating 53 slices of bacon. Uh, the protein lactalbumin in milk is a key factor in the onset of diabetes and other autoimmune disorders. Thus is a major reason to not give cow's milk to infants small children. Um, also, Dr. Um, T. Colin Campbell, some of you have heard of at Cornell, one of his lectures, I remember him mentioning that um, there's extensive documentation showing that K casein is a prime carcinogen, and that is the form of protein found in milk, is casein. I should have put that on a slide. Uh, major childhood health concerns that are linked to cow's milk include these conditions infect various infectious diseases, <clears throat> juvenile diabetes, early atherosclerosis, lowered intelligence levels, and by the way, um, fluoride in the drinking water causes significantly lowered intelligence. The scientist who discovered that um, was actually fired from her position when she published that information. Um, also, the vaccine regimen that is currently recommended. Uh, Dr. Blaylock, who is uh, a bird certi certified neurosurgeon, believes it's in a range of 10 to 14 IQ points are lost in infants and young children from the basic um, vaccine regimen. The idea is, of course, to dumb down the population and you can control them. Uh, allergies, iron deficiency, milk sensitivities, acne, 
dental decay, all concerns in relation to children. What about adult issues and diseases? Coronary artery disease, greater risk of that, greater risk of various cancers, uh, increased risk of different neurological disorders, allergies, digestive problems, as well as different infectious diseases, as we showed earlier in the presentation. So the conclusion of the matter is found in Genesis 129, where the prescription given by the maker of mankind is, I've given you every plant bearing seed on the face of the earth, in every tree in which there is fruit, let this be your food. So I'd recommend that we take this counsel to heart. And that's the end of this presentation. Thank you.